Welcome to the Health Trip Podcast. My name is Jill Foos. I'm a functional medicine and integrative nutrition health coach. I created this podcast to bring you along as we travel down intriguing science-packed roads, debunking old medical paradigms and perusing new innovative therapies and modalities with the finest functional medicine doctors, practitioners, and like-minded biohackers while living our best life. Enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode on the Health Trip Podcast. If you're a midlife woman, then chances are you have experienced a higher degree of stress lately. As women transition through menopause and experience significant physical, emotional, and hormonal changes, finding strategies to manage stress, enhance well being, and stay grounded becomes mission critical. This is where mindfulness comes in, offering a path toward self awareness, self care balance, and emotional resilience during this transformative phase of your life. In this episode, my guest and I discussed how practicing mindfulness can help women not only navigate the changes, but also embrace midlife as a time of growth and self-discovery. We'll break down simple ways to incorporate mindfulness into your daily routine, talk about its science-backed benefits, and explore how it can improve everything from mood swings to body image. This is also a time when many midlife women experience issues with their sexual wellness and pleasure, and mindfulness is absolutely a part of that equation. This is the second episode in my mindfulness series, and I'm excited to introduce you to my next guest, Cami Smalley. Cami is a National Board Certified Health and Wellness Coach, just like I am, and the founder of Guided Resilience, where she shares her mindful pause approach to well-being, and she is the author of the book, Mindful Pause, A Self-Care Guide to Resilience and Well-Being. Cami has decades of experience supporting well-being in the workplace setting. For nearly 10 years, she provided her coaching and training services to employees at Regions Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota, and the surrounding metro area. In addition to coaching, Cami helped the hospital create a center for employee resilience, and she contributed to several initiatives, including supporting victims of workplace violence, departmental support during transitions, coaching return to work referrals, and an exciting lifestyle medicine approach to treating back and neck pain. I know I could use that. Short medical disclaimer, before we dive in, by listening to this podcast, you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice or to make any lifestyle changes to treat any medical condition in yourself or others. Consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. And this entire disclaimer also applies to any of my guests on my podcast. So sit back, open your mind, and let's dive into mindfulness part two. Hey, Cami, welcome to the Health Trip Podcast. Hello, Jill. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I am so excited to have you on today. You are my part two in my mindfulness series for midlife women. And you and I are about the same age. And we know that there is a lot going on during midlife. There's a lot of physiological changes that we're dealing with. Some women are cruising right through and others are really hitting a wall and um, stress comes up a, a lot. And who better to have on than you, who is an expert in helping people manage their stress. And that's what the topic is today. Well, I'm happy to be here and share my lens, my path with people that are looking for resourcing. Yeah. So how did you even decide to focus your health coaching career in mindfulness? I love that question, Jill, because it's kind of funny, actually. I started from an awareness that I come from a lineage of women with short tempers and sharp tongues. <laughs> and I knew that these women loved me, my mother, my grandmother. It was no doubt. There was no doubt that there was love there. But the way that they engaged with the difficulties of life was to be very reactionary. And I wanted something different for myself because I knew how that felt in my body and I didn't want that. And then I became a mother myself and I wanted to try and create an environment um, that was a little less reactionary. So that was one reason. And then I became an athlete. And as an athlete, everybody has some version of wanting to excel in performance, whether it's mm -hmm. at business or in school um, or in our family life, um, in sport, in music. And so mindfulness became another tool to put in my toolbox for uh, 
achieving optimal performance. And then as a coach, my mantra in coaching um, became helping people become a master of their moments and not a victim of their day. Mm. And so much of that fulfilling, that living into that intention requires mindfulness and the tools that come along with um, developing a mindfulness practice. So though that's been kind of my path that has kept returning me to mindfulness skill development. I, abs- I love that answer because so many people grow up in an environment that isn't conducive to them. And when they recognize it at an early age and can pivot that trajectory of their life path, it's so helpful versus someone who gets stuck in that cycle and just continues to recycle those old patterns in their new family that they've created. So, you know, it's, it's, um, and it's very, um, it's hard as a young person to recognize that and to recognize this doesn't feel good to me and I want it to be different. Yeah. And you know what, Jill, mindfulness is also a really critical point on how we do that work. So it's not about blaming. Notice Mm -hmm. I prefaced my, my story by saying, I knew my mother and grandmother loved me. And so mindfulness allows us to have a deep well of compassion, recognizing that these women faced their own challenges in their lives and were doing the best that they could. And so mindfulness helps me have the compassion for others and simultaneously navigate a path that's going to be truer to my alignment and what I seek. Yeah, I love that. So today we're going to talk really uh, to that midlife woman who's in that menopausal transition And for that woman, why is mindfulness so important for her? Well, you know, in mindfulness, we like to look at all conditions of upset as teachers and certainly getting to that midlife phase of life. Some women have not yet had an occasion of of significant difficulty um, a mo- and a, a reason for emotional disruption. And so emotional dysregulation is often a, a cause at midlife. And certainly menopause can throw a lot of curveballs at us. Um, so I think that that emotional dysregulation, that's what gets people to um, uh, seek uh, support and, and uh, also habit. By the time we're midlife, we have a few cow paths that we've yeah. created. And so trying to solve, you know, the problem um, uh, with the same uh, re- solutions as the past sometimes doesn't work. So we have to look for new tools to meet the current demand. And so menopause has some of the cognitive issues that can become new, um, the emotional dysregulation and just the um, and the mechanical habit of expecting old uh, tools to work in these current conditions. Yeah. That's what we often hear as coaches is I'm doing everything the same way and nothing is working anymore. I've gained weight. My hair is thinning. My skin looks different. I can't exercise as well as I used to. I don't sleep as well as I used to. I'm still eating the same way, you know, so you're right. We have to acknowledge that we're in a different phase of our life. We're now entering the final third um, of our life. And what do we want that to look like? And I believe that mindfulness is a massive Massive, uh, plays a massive role in, in the trajectory of the next 10, 20, 30, or 40 years. Yeah, it's, you know, Jill, it's a real balance because uh, in go- with coaching, we're helping people establish goals, right? Yeah. So we're asking them to vision a future that they're willing to invest and work for. Mm-hmm. But there's a delicate balance, especially for menopausal women, because Definitely, there's a vision out there for how I want to look and live and be like in in my future. But we also have to reserve time and space to accept what is. And there are some there are some changes that come with menopause that really challenge our ability to accept what is. Um, I love the products and the resources that you connect your audience to. And so there's a great opportunity to kind of test products and work with what we have to to seek improvement and and betterment and meet myself in these changes with deep compassion, acceptance, and love. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I've felt that for myself, right? I've, 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 I'm sure you have too. We 
get to a certain point and I hit, well, for myself, I have said to myself, all right, this is my body. This is the energy level I have today. And so this is going to be what I do with that energy level today. It's not going to look like two days ago when I killed it in the gym, it's going to look like what it is today and just be, be good with that. Yeah. There's a poet, uh, Donna Fowles. I often use her poetry, one of her poems in particular as a mindfulness um, moment. And I incorporate it into my body practices, into Hatha yoga. And she says to meet the moment with fresh eyes. Mm. And that's something that I think is a great mantra for women as we move through menopause, because mm. it this is not the body of 10 years ago. No, this is sometimes not even the body of 10 days ago. Now we have had by the life cycle of a woman, we have had the experience of the fluctuations of our body on a monthly cycle. So we have had some good training in that. Um, mm -hmm. But then the added season of menopause is one where we have to really stretch that muscle of acceptance and meet this season with fresh eyes. Yeah, I love that. How does mindfulness benefit our mental health during this phase of our life? Well, first off, I'll say that mindfulness helps us remember that we are not just our thoughts. And so thoughts um, can become cloudy. Um, we can feel at it's this phase of our life that our memory is being tested. Mm -hmm. um, and mindfulness helps us remember that we are more than just our cognition. Um, so mindfulness helps downregulate the the dysregulation emotionally that follows the disruption of cognitive challenge. So mo often we get disturbed when I can't remember, uh, when I'm a word escapes me, or um, I can't think as clearly on my, my jobs and my work that used to come just so naturally. Um, and as soon as there's an emotional disruption, that's where there's the uh, opportunity for mindfulness to come in and ease that, which I think we'll get into some heart math, but the really we think getting into the heart is where we really need to orient because that will help address um, some of the cognitive issues uh, that we experience during that season. Oh yeah, I have had many days like that. In fact, just this week, I had a full day of just forgetting so many things, showed up at an appointment an hour late, um, left supplies that I needed at my home when I left the house. Just, it was one thing after, I'm glad it actually happened on one full day instead of spread throughout the whole week. Cause at least I was like, all right, all right. If it's going to just be this way, let it all just go together and then we'll move on to tomorrow. Um, but I felt, I felt really betrayed by my, my mind. Um, oh, for yeah. most of the day. And it had me, you know, thinking, okay, this is part of this and I'm doing all the right things in terms of supporting my, my brain health, my heart health, my physical, my sleep, all of the things, right. The exercise, the eating well, and it still is going to happen. And, um, it, it took me some time to really come back to myself and say, it's okay. Yeah. Tomorrow's another day. I'm going to get a good night's sleep and, and we keep moving forward. Yeah. Now you described a great scenario, Jill, that many of us know as like waking up on the wrong side of the bed mm -hmm. or falling into the down spiral mm -hmm. um, and the down spiral can be fed by what you described the feeling of betrayal. Betrayal mm -hmm. is, I mean, on the energy, on the, on the emotional spectrum, betrayal is a really significant emotion. Mm -hmm. And in Barbara Fredrickson's work on emotions, she's one of the re leading researchers on positive emotion. And she's described that we need three renewing emotions to override the influence of one depleting emotion. Now, notice I use the words renewing and depleting because we don't want to negate the fact that we are human and we have a wide spectrum of emotion. And mm. so we don't want to deny, diminish, or excuse ourselves from those emotions. They're all relevant and absolutely necessary to our well-being. However, there is reason to want to move as quickly out of depleting emotions and into a place of an upward spiral because the evidence is clear that we can come back quickly 
Mm -hmm. And that we then get to move from the best part of ourselves that we can access in the frontal cortex once we make that shift. So you did it just in your own story. You started at betrayal, but then there was this encouragement, your inner coach, your gentle, mm -hmm. uh, your gentle uh, comforter that said, it's okay, Jill, you know, you're doing the right things, reminding you of your positive commitments. And all of that is effort to get that three to one ratio. Mm. Build yourself up because we can reverse that down spiral and then enter into the up spiral that helps us become a master of our moments and not a victim of a day, not surrendering a day to a down spiral. Hmm. And speaking of a down spiral becoming an up spiral, a lot of women really struggle with their sexual health and wellness, right? So we're going through these physiological changes, um, these genital urinary changes going on, but then also our arousal and our desire to engage in sex with our partner that we love, um, is, has been really challenged during this time for many, many women. And so you and I offline, were talking about how mindfulness can play a role in this equation of a woman getting back her optimal sexual health and wellness. Yeah, that is one where it is mindfulness can really be key. Yeah. So mindfulness, I'm going to start with a, a really brief story. Um, and in this story, it's an, it's described as an old Cherokee tale. And in this story, a grandfather is speaking to his grandson, describing um, that there are two wolves inside us. And one that is envy and jealousy and, and greed and competition and anger and all betrayal, all of those kind of depleting emotions. And the other wolf is the wolf of love and kindness and compassion and generosity and understanding. And that these two wolves are always fighting. And the grandson asks, which one wins? And the answer is the one that you feed. Mm. And so part of mindfulness is recognizing that we have a large container in our experience, our life is complex. And that you described several challenging um, manifestations of sexual arousal, the sexual experience, the relationship with our partner that's changing. And to be able to see that and notice the accompanying emotions that come with it is gonna be really critical to then transforming that back into the energy of not being self preoccupied, but then turning attention outward into an expression of love. I would also say, so there's, there's emotional regulation in that story, seeing the impact that it has, um, those conditions have on my emotional landscape. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing that I would have is breath. You know, breath from every tradition that teaches mindfulness, centering, transcendence, transcending ego, um, overcoming human suffering, breath is key. It starts for us in women when we birth a baby, we're taught how to breathe, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would encourage people to notice what happens to your breath when you're hijacked in the, in the moments of desire and connection with a partner. Notice where our mind goes and notice where our emotions get hijacked and what happens to the breath. And if we can start to learn to shift all of that in the moment, it allows for a lot of creativity. Again, the bedroom can be a place of, of change too. There, there might be some additional tools in that toolbox that need to meet the season of menopause. Does that help? Oh, absolutely. I think you're, you're spot on about starting with the breath and just the sheer recognition that things are different yes. and you get to this opportunity to recreate this experience. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, there's an, there is a mantra in the work that there's literally um, hundreds of ways to solve a problem. And so if we can carry that into all our challenges, trusting, trusting that there are many ways to accomplish our aim. Mm, yes. No one size fits all approach. 
Yeah. Yeah. How does mindfulness differ from meditation or in your book, you talk about a state of flow and you also talk about spirituality. And so a lot of people, um, including myself years ago, used to think, I don't have time for mindfulness. I Meditation doesn't appeal to me because when I think of meditation, I think of people in a room in their home or a room in a, in a center where it's, you know, Buddhas are all over the place and pillows. And, you know, that doesn't speak to me. That yeah. didn't speak to me today. It didn't speak to me back then. But I want to be able to personalize this yeah. path for myself, because I do want to experience that. So go through all the differences between these um, different concepts. Oh, that is a whole book. <laughs> <laughs> that is a big, that is a big question, but I'm going to tell you how I arrived at mindfulness in, in my particular path. I started my work in coaching at an inner city hospital in the twin cities in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I'm married to a cardiologist. And so you don't get any more mechanistic than cardiology. And then yeah. I'm working with nurses and doctors, very evidence-based orientation. Now I can hang with the best of the yogis. I can sit in a temple and I can sit in a church and I can uh, sit on the pillow. And I love that sort of work. But there are some people that, that like you, that that's not their thing. And so I knew if I was going to meet the, the audience of a, of a varied group, I needed to be able to speak a language that met them. That's what mm -hmm. took me to heart math because heart math gave me an opportunity to, to understand the science behind what the aim is for most people in their curiosity about mindfulness is they want life to feel better. <laughs> Mm -hmm. They want to be able to, like I came wanting to be a better parent. Some people wanting to be better performers at the work or a, a season of life that they find difficult, whether it's menopause or, or a per, another health crisis or loss of a loved one. We meet these challenging human experience moments and we want to feel equipped. And so there are many ways to meet that. And that's the first question I ask people that come to my beginning mindfulness course is what are you looking for? All right. What's your why? What's your why? Because that can really say a lot. And I am curious when I take an intake form from people, what are your current practices? Do you have a practice of meditation, mindfulness, or prayer? Because there I get insight into, do they like to walk in nature? Mm -hmm. uh, do they have a strong tradition in their Jewish, Hindu, or Catholic, or Christian formation? Um, all of that is very relevant because at its very basic essence, mindfulness can hold all of that. And as coaches, we know that people are going to be more successful in integrating a new habit if it aligns and it fits with their personal motivations and values. Absolutely. So, um, I try to verse myself in a lot of different voices, and that can be purely scientific, like heart math. So I can talk to my doctors and nurses. I can go into my Catholic audience and I have my Thomas Keating and, and my Richard Rohr influence. I, I can speak on the more secular realm with like John Kabat-Zinn and Eckhart Tolle. And then there's the beautiful Eastern tradition voices, the Thich Nhat Hans, Pima Chodrons. I mean, we do not lack for beautiful voices and teachers to help guide us. Um, but it does begin with the question is why? Why do I, why am I seeking mindfulness? Right. And what is going to resonate with me? What is going to allow me to create a long-term sustainable routine or habit that I can count on in my home, on a vacation, on at a work event. I yeah. always say to my clients, every one of us has a unique health equation, right? Yes. Just that, oh, we have, that. We, yeah, we have a unique fingerprint and we, we all have a different approach here. And yeah. mindfulness to me, I love your approach that you can speak to all these different types of um, mindfulness approaches because You've got to find the one that someone's going to be like, ah, that one, that well, one speaks why, to me. Yes. And that's why I kept the structure of the mindful pause so generic. So the mindful pause is four simple steps to stop, mm -hmm. breathe, think, and choose. Mm -hmm. Now within that, the stop is, is really just an opportunity to wake up. 
So the stop, as you mentioned, it does not have to be on a meditation stool or pillow. It means I'm waking up to this present moment. Then I can breathe. And the breath is that gateway to down-regulating the stress response and shifting the inner landscape. Then the think step is the opportunity to bring in those renewing emotions that we know turn the down spiral into the up spiral. And then the choose step allows me then to be deliberate in setting alignment, the course going forward from this moment, I want to be actionable to living in alignment with what I value, what I believe, what is highest good for others and myself. And then that drives my conscious intentions. In your business, how do you see most people arriving at the first stop step? Right. So people, people, everyone's, everyone's just living their life, but when do you know you need to stop is, Um, you know, is it, is it you hit, you're hitting a bottom? Yeah. Yeah. Most often when people come to meet me and, and specifically I was a coach to meet people. I was a resilience coach and that's how I kind of form my work. So yes, most of the time the pain point has gotten significant enough that people want to seek change. Now, there've been plenty that have um, become accustomed to our culture's on-demand kind of expectation. And while there is an ability to quickly shift in a moment, mindfulness is a skill that does require practice. So getting back to your question between the difference, my understanding, my use of mindfulness versus meditation, Uh I consider meditation the training. That's like for me as an athlete, that was going into the gym. I'm training Uh the mind-body connection. I'm going through the skills. I'm memorizing the feeling of a perfect free throw. Then mindfulness is taking that conditioning and applying it on the go in my life. So Mm. I can sit on a pillow and practice stop, breathe, think, and choose. If you don't want to sit on a pillow, you can be, you know, taking a walk in the woods, sitting on your porch with your cup of coffee, but giving practice to what it feels like to have an inner equanimity and calm. And we have to practice that. And then mindfulness, that's meditation, formal meditation. Mm -hmm. And then mindfulness is the fruit of that work. That's being able to recall with a single breath, being able to say to the body, oh, she wants to go back to that place that we've trained of inner equanimity and calm. So the two go kind of hand in hand, um, but it does require some training and practice like everything does, right? Right. And it's, it's, um, it, eventually it will become like brushing your teeth. Right. And, you know, when I work with my clients and we're working on these lifestyle changes, it's all hard in the beginning. It's unfamiliar. It's foreign territory. It's, um, it's just hard. Yeah. It's hard work. Yeah, it is. And, and that is where nothing that's worth striving for is usually achieved easily. Um, And that's where working with someone can be really helpful, you know, getting, Mm -hmm. becoming part of a group. Um, There's something very powerful to group energy when learning a skill um, and answering questions, having a teacher, a coach, or a guide, um, somebody to, to mentor you, guide you along that path. Yeah. What are some common misconceptions people have about mindfulness or meditation? that is going to make my problems go away. (laughs) And it doesn't, Ah. you know, I've had many healthcare workers come in very um, disturbed by their emotional dysregulation. And and that's what I was hinting at before, you know, it's not like taking a pill and having Mm -hmm. something just go away. Uh, What mindfulness does is it gives you the, the uh, command of being able to continue to show up to life, even it's even in its complexity, complexity, difficulty, loss, disturbance, and to meet it, trusting that you have the inner uh, fortitude, the inner uh, strength to be present to it in the way that you want to. 
Hmm. So that's the most misconception is that it will just make life easier. Life's going to continue to be hard in a lot of different ways. I think another obvious one is that you don't have time for it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great one. And that again is what took me to heart math because, you know, I first started studying um, with mindfulness-based stress reduction. That's John Kabat-Zinn's very effective methodology. And you know, he's a, an, an MD and he was given the most difficult of um, patients that had chronic health conditions that were really uh, disturbing their lives. And his protocol is significant. Like when we studied, it's an eight week course um, and it was like four, up to 45 minutes a day in practice. And my husband would never be able to do that as a physician. It just was not something accessible. Uh, but what was exciting about heart math was that I found that actually, because I'm able to use biofeedback, a technology that shows heart rate variability, we're able to see that actually we can recover, come back to ourselves in less than two minutes, sometimes as quickly as 20 seconds. I have a video experience that I share with clients that demonstrates how we can come back to ourselves in less than a minute. That's very powerful for people to appreciate is that while life can be difficult, the conditions do not have to change. My reaction to them is within my control and I can come back to that inner calm and peace within a minute or two. And like you said, not to solve the problem, the problem's not going to no. go away, but the way in which you stop, think, breathe, breathe, stop, breathe, think, and choose. And the reason why this yeah. is an important um, piece on taking little time is because without self-regulation, we sustain an agitated energy and mood throughout our day. In fact, for a lot of people, that becomes a habituated way of being. They don't even recognize it anymore as agitation. It's just, this is what high performance and busy days feels like. Mm -hmm. But the cost of that is for many people, overwhelm, exhaustion, compassion, fatigue, burnout. And so, and as we age, especially in the season of menopause, we don't have sometimes the same emotional capacity or the physical capacity to endure those days as we did when we were 25. Right. So conserving energy becomes the name of, of the game. And emotional regulation is a, a big target that if we can learn to self-regulate that, we can reclaim a lot of energy, which then makes us feel more masterful in executing a day. Mm. You've mentioned heart math a few times, and I I'm going to bet that the listeners are not that familiar with heart math. If you could just take us through what it is and how you use it. Yeah. Heart Math Institute has been around for decades. They've done a lot of research on heart rate variability and our ability to establish what they call coherence. And coherence is that it goes by many names, you know, inner peace, flow, calm, equanimity. It's an alert state. It's a mindful state. It's not necessarily relaxation, you know? So relaxation is um, a down-regulated, mostly parasympathetic rest and digest kind of um, phase of the autonomic nervous system. Coherence is mindfulness. It's an alert state. And even athletes, military, police, um, performers, you can be coherent and be performing at a higher uh, um, heart rate, a higher level of autonomic nervous system uh, functioning. So HeartMath designed a tool that people can use to give them that biofeedback. Um, and the, the benefit of that is being able to see, <laughs> affirming for myself, oh, I can see that I am self-regulating. This is what it looks like. This is what it feels like. And when, for many people, that kind of feedback is a really powerful piece to affirm that what they're doing is working. So it's something that someone is wearing. Yep. It's a pull, it's a, it's a heart rate monitor. The, the, um, their product takes the heart rate 
just like anything else that you would, your watches measure your heart rate. It takes that and then it has an algorithm that it applies so that it gives you feedback in the form of a signed wave. Mm -hmm. um, and so when it's jagged and, and irregular, that's incoherent. That's usually when we're dysregulated in emotion and breath. And then there's coherence where that sine wave smooths out. It becomes balanced. And that's the target that shows me that my tool is working. And so does someone wear this short-term, long-term, are they going to work wearing this? Like, yeah. you know, uh, you know, how, how are they using it, um, to their benefit to see how they're performing and recovering in a work environment or at the home environment? It varies person to person. I have yeah. had clients that I have the device. And so when we would have a session in person, I would hook them up and, and they would practice. And so they're able to get the feedback and then they have their own personal practice that they're working on. Um, and they start to be able to have their own. I, I have them work with the inner laboratory of you. Ultimately as a coach, I really like to be less attached to feedback. I mean, I've had people tell me that their watch is telling them they're not getting enough sleep. <laughs> and I say, well, how do you feel? Well, I feel fine. I'm like, well, maybe trust your own experience there, but Overall, what I'm looking for is them to develop their own inner measuring, being able to mm. choose. So it's not something that I encourage people to have ongoing. Now, that said, there are some people that are wired hot and they like to have the tool themselves. They train with it. They train usually not in the work environment, although they might carry it in their purse. And if they have a day that's upsetting, they might pull it out, take their break and check to see that their, uh, that their self-care practice brings them back. Um, to a more uh, calm and alert state. Um, but it can be used just as feedback in training too, just to get that launched so that you can memorize your target. Mm, I love that. I, I, I'm all about collecting data on, on oneself, right? Because I agree with you that when people see things in black and white, they have these aha moments and it helps them pivot their lifestyle in a different direction. It just gives them confirmation that, okay, this this, this option or this choice that I'm making isn't the best for me, but over here, here's three other options that are going to be better for me. And I have it on black and white. It's on paper. Yeah. Um, and it's, I'm not guessing anymore. Exactly. And you know, mm -hmm. a, a really important piece of this too, is then self-reflecting afterward. Yeah. Um, so being able to do gain the self-awareness from reviewing you know, and uh, many traditions have some version of reviewing my day and looking for those places where I lost myself and being curious about um, what was the trigger, you know, because a lot of times these are patterns that will be repeated, right? And so yes. with that that's observation, um, we can learn. Yeah, so interesting. So many women struggle with brain fog and cognition issues like we were talking about and fatigue can mindfulness rewire the brain yeah yes mindfulness rewires the brain by helping you get out of your brain and first down into your heart heart math um one of their one of their lessons that you know i have a master's degree in physical education a master's degree in holistic health studies and i don't remember ever learning this but heart math reminded me that the heart has what they call a heart brain and there are actually more messages that go from the heart to the brain than from the brain to the heart. Mm. So, you know, in coaching, a lot of times we're, you know, mm -hmm. leading into let's be strategic, let's plan, let's vision, let's, you know, mm -hmm. we, we need to start by making sure that people have a command of that emotional landscape. Uh, you know, I think it was Einstein that said, you can't solve a problem under the same conditions in which it was created. Mm -hmm. So we are habituated to a place of busy, of overwhelm, of constant movement. We lose the capacity literally to connect to the frontal cortex. So when you're talking about accessing and improving cognition, it starts at the heart. So when I'm able to get into that coherent inner uh, state, evidence shows that that is what opens up capacity to reach 
the frontal cortex where I can think strategically, I can be creative, I can be empathetic, I can remember memory is enhanced. Um, all of that is um, enhanced by our emotional self-regulation. Hmm. Very, very so that interesting. That really comes first. Yeah. And uh, yes, yeah, so that is uh, trying to convince people to quiet down our over-reliance on cognition and to develop some skills in emotional regulation, that is critical for people then manifesting their best intentions. And it just speaks to the midlife woman going through these changes that we're trying to, as you said, us coaches, we're trying to help them re-navigate, re-strategize, rebuild the toolbox. And sometimes they're just not there yet. Yeah. Yeah. And patience, I mean, it, it is a skill and, um, and, and it needs resourcing. And there's a lot of teachers out there. There's a lot of apps out there. There's a lot of yeah. voices that uh, can meet a person on, on that path of cultivating the skill. Yeah. Yeah. How does someone know if they need a mindfulness practice, we, you, in your book, you talk about these red flags, but you refer to them as body whispers. And yeah. I would love for you to speak to that because in today's day and age, we are super women. We have kids, we have jobs, we have parents that we're caring for. We have our friends. We, ha we are really, really busy, too busy. And, um, a lot of women wear that like a badge of honor. You know, there are times where I'll be somewhere, I'll run into someone that I know and how are you doing? Oh, well, I, and they go through their entire day with me, right? It's like yeah. a, it's like a 12 hour day squeezed into like six hours. And, you know, it's this badge of honor that they're wearing. Yeah. yeah. Well, yes. So there's a couple of things that I like to do uh, that I reference uh, when I'm working with people in mindfulness. The, I'll get to the one you mentioned in a moment. First, there it's also in my book, the Mindful Attention Awareness Scale. And people can find that anywhere on the internet or mm -hmm. you can go to guidedresilience.com and it's on my resources page. It's a very brief inventory that has you um, respond to a series. I think it's tw only 12 questions or so. Um, that then will score you on your mindfulness. Mm -hmm. um, just things like dropping things, fumbling, forgetting things, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. speaking, being emotionally dysregulated, things like that. So there's that assessment. And I like to use that, especially because, you know, we're about marking progress as coaches too, right? Like it's nice to know a starting point so we can score it. And then you, maybe you practice your mindfulness for several weeks and then go back and take the test again and see how you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I like to have that as a, as a starting point. And then I really like, because every individual experiences stress differently, there's the personal stress warning signals um, worksheet that I have people look at on physically how stress may show up as in body tensions or upset mm -hmm. stomachs or uh, hair, hair loss, acne. Yes. Yes. And then cognitive, um, mm -hmm. you show already the, you know, the fuzzy thinking, the lo the memory loss, uh, some of those cognitive things, emotional, we've been talking about emotional dysregulation. Um, and that's a handout too. relational, you mentioned the bedroom, I mean, so there can be check marks to the, uh, the relational area. Um, so that's a worksheet too that people can look at. And I did, I do refer to that as a whisper, a yell, and a two by four. The sooner mm -hmm. we get to know, because we can ignore those women that you described that are the high right. achievers, the on the go, the, you know, they really, we become skilled at not paying attention. Absolutely. And so there's a real effort in getting to know this machine again in its wholeness physically emotionally cognitively relationally and the stress warning signals can just be a nice cheat sheet um for you to kind of be self-aware yeah i love that that's a great resource you also talk about reframing the perception of self-care and i really gravitated toward towards that um 
people think that practicing self-care means taking time away from caring for for others. And we're women, we care for others. Um, oh, yeah. And that self-care is selfish and we shouldn't prioritize. Our, I mean, how many women have you met with where they say, you know what, I'll get to that habit when my twins leave for college or oh, yeah. I'll, I'll get to that on January 1st. I mean, that's why New Year's resolutions just don't work. Right. Uh, yes. And I will add to that, that menopause often happens when, you know, our children are grown up, but they mm -hmm. we don't stop mothering <laughs> right? until there's those sandwich years. Right. So we've yes. got, these, you know, these adult forming children, and then we have aging parents and mm -hmm. the, there's a tendency for the woman to be the one that bears the lion's share of the caretaking on both ends, both for the children and for um, our aging parents. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, that is, um, uh, remind me there went my fuzzy brain. Where were we going with this? The question we were talking about self-care and reframing the perception yes. of self-care. Yeah. So, you know, I mentioned that my husband is, um, a cardio cardiologist and I was sharing my self-care content with him once. And he said, uh, you know, the heart is actually a great teacher of self-care. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, the heart has the, the significant job of keeping you alive. There is mm -hmm. no doing your, all of your commitments, all of your duties, all your relationships without your heart working. Mm -hmm. And the heart actually prioritizes self-care. It does before giving blood flow to the rest of this machine, it gives blood flow to itself first. Mm -hmm. And so the heart doesn't wait for a vacation, a day off or a weekend or a right time in life. Mm -hmm. The heart incorporates self-care into every beat of the heart. So self-care, while it can look like luxury, pampering, those sort of things, self-care is also a skill, an essential skill for sustainability as a mom, as a cardiologist, as whatever roles we're playing in life, that we need to find the simple ways to integrate self-care in throughout our day. And a lot of your products and resources that you give people are giving people the opportunities to, to say yes to some right. of those simple additions and permission to let go of some things uh, that are not essential so that we can be sustainable. So yeah, self-care is not selfish. It's absolutely a necessity and it's a skill that we have to learn for some of us. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm a mom of five kids and they're all out of the house now. They're all in there, you know, between 21 and 29. And I remember how hard it was. It was really, they're all two years apart. It was very difficult. Oh, um, yeah. and, and I, always prioritized some kind of movement. There were two things I prioritized, my movement and my food choices. And th those were the only two things I could actually really do and accomplish um, at my best during those very chaotic times when they were all very young. Oh, absolutely. You know, and I just babysat here, I thought I had advanced, Jill, in mm -hmm. my mindfulness because I have a quiet home now, too. I mean, the uh -huh. only thing that's disrupting my life now is this puppy that's at my feet <laughs> who just decided to um, chew on things that she's not supposed to. Um, but my, I had the occasion of babysitting my granddaughter. And, oh, my gosh, flashback to being a busy mom and how quickly... Mm -hmm. I can become dysregulated again. Mm -hmm. So there is no perfection in this. Even no. with years of practice, we're going to be disturbed. And so giving ourselves, you know, uh, a little bit of grace and uh, to be able to continue to just start a moment fresh and to recognize that the past is done. This is a new moment that I can come back to myself. Yeah. I'll tell you a little story I'll share. I went through a divorce about seven years ago. And at the time I went through the divorce, um, I, you know, of course it was 
divorce is very hard. And mm. I, what I did to remind myself to take care of myself was on sticky notes. I wrote down different messages and I left them around my house. Like if I had to open up a cabinet, it would be, there'd be one in there. If I had to open up my medicine cabinet, it'd be in there. It was on a mirror that I looked at. It was in a dresser that I went to. And I had all these little messages like you have pretty eyes or oh. you have nice hair, or you're going to eat well, eat well today. You know, it was all these different messages to remind me who I was, how I wanted to practice self-care. And it was super, you know, it was a little corny, but it worked for me. It was, it was, I needed the visual reminder, not a phone reminder. I needed a paper visual reminder. I also needed the, the um, action of writing the message to myself, choosing what was the message going to be and where was I going to place it strategically so that I would see it. And it really got me through a really, really tough time. But I must have known deep down inside that I had to maintain some type of practice for, of self-care. I love that you arrived at a very unique um, self-care practice that met you. I mean, I, I am amazed at the peop at people that I work with that arrive when they allow themselves mm -hmm. to kind of follow their intuition, arrive at an answer that no coach could ever come up with or design. Right. That, right. You know, one of the mantra, one of the quotes that I use is from Bryant McGill. Um, he says, inside each of us is a marvelous compass, one that greatly favors life, freedom, and vitality. Mm. And that is part of what we're doing when we come to our mindfulness practices is quieting the noise of the external world enough that we can hear our own internal compass. You know, we just came through September. I tell this story in Mindful Pause. Um, we just came through September, which is the, the month of the great migration. The monarch butterfly flies mm. from some of like Northern states like I'm in here in Wisconsin, all the way thousands of miles back down to Mexico, a particular tree on a particular mountain where their regeneration story begins. And every summer, then another generation, four generations of monarchs travel north. And it's the super monarch in September that travels all the way back down to Mexico. It's never been to Mexico. Its parents have never been to Mexico. Its grandparents have never been there. Mm -hmm. So we don't understand quite how it knows where to go. Mm -hmm. And isn't that a familiar feeling? Yeah, absolutely. Who am I? Where am I going? Mm -hmm. At divorce, at menopause, at major life curves. Who am I? Where am yep. I going? And in order to best discover that, a lot of times that requires a stillness to connect into the inner compass, to let go of the influence and noise of the external world. I mean, mindfulness is really, menopause is a particularly powerful time because for many people, it's a season of lessening the attachment to the things of the world, influence, material items, things that we worked hard, we enjoyed, they, they gave us right. a lot of parenting, but now there's another season. And what does that look like? Well, we stop, we breathe, we get into that inner compass. Yes. And then design a life that is going to be another version of our, our Mexico. Absolutely. I mean, this is a time where many women say, I don't give a, you know what, about things that I used to care about anymore. Yeah. I am recreating my journey. I'm recreating the next third of my life. And it's going to, I mean, I did the same thing. I got divorced. I also was going through perimenopause at the time. And I thought to myself, I am going to recreate the trajectory of my life. I've always had a vision in my life. I didn't have that. I wasn't living that vision, part of this vision in my um, married life. And I am living the life I have now is the vision that oh. I never thought that I would be able to obtain. Way to go. Yeah. Way to and, go. And I started that when I was 48. I'm now almost 57. Oh. And so it's never too late out there no. to, to put these practices in play, um, to Do you remember Jane Goodall, 
Yeah, of course. She was on TV the other night being interviewed by Stephen Colbert. Mm -hmm. What is she like? 88 or some beautiful. Yeah, I think she's in her 90s, actually. Yeah, she's a beautiful woman and she's still reimagining her life. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so, yes, I think that we have some beautiful models of women who do some of their best work. Absolutely. In the decades beyond, you know, what our culture often sees as the most influential and most powerful. Absolutely. Well, as we come to an end of this amazing episode, um, I wanted to ask you for the person listening to us speak right now, and they're thinking, okay, I'm, I'm ready. I've stopped. I've acknowledged that I'm ready. I just don't know how to get ready. What are some easy steps for that person to just start practicing mindfulness in their, in their daily routine? Um, you know what? Uh, I started with insight timer. Insight timer is a great app. I also, um, read, I became a seeker. Um, and so looking for the voices, you know, listening to this podcast, following the breadcrumbs, um, looking to the authors, the voices that might be most meaningful to you and just starting to, uh, walk a path and going into the laboratory of you and letting, starting to hone that inner compass on what resonates, what doesn't. And, uh, as far as a daily practice, uh, you know, you can go to my website, website, guidedresilience.com and see how the four simple steps to stop, breathe, think, and choose might be a beginning place for you to just take 15 minutes, um, to refine the skill of stopping a daily messaging of prioritizing your self-care learning how to access the breath as a tool for self-regulation, how to mobilize your renewing emotions as a a repeated effort in the moment and throughout the day, and to more and more exercise your agency moment by moment, becoming a master of moments, not a victim Mm. of agency. Stop, breathe, think, and choose. And in the words of Thomas Keating, He's centering prayer. So from, you might find a teacher from your, your religious tradition. Mm -hmm. There are contemplative teachers from Jewish, Hindu, Christian. That might be a gateway for some people. Thomas Keating, like the day that you described where everything seemed to down spiral, Mm -hmm. he would smile and say that every one of those was an opportunity for you to self-remember and come back to yourself. And what a gift that is to not see those interruptions as a problem, but as an opportunity to self-remember. And when we can start to get to that sort of dance with life, where it doesn't knock us down, that we can laugh or smile or hug Mm -hmm. in moments that we find the most disturbing, that's when we know that we're making some progress. I love that, Cami. That resonates with me so much because so many times my clients will show up to a session and they'll say, you're going to be really mad at me today. Um, I didn't do this. And I said, there are no mistakes here. There are no mistakes. There are only learning moments. Yes. These are just opportunities. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I think there's, there's the no, no we, judgment. Yes. That's one of the best gifts of engaging with the coach. Cause we hold that space. Cause that yes. has to be practiced. Yes. That is a lifelong, um, uh, attachment to, uh, a performance, um, mindset. And so, yeah, that's, that's great that you give your clients that permission. Absolutely. Wow. Cami, what an amazing nugget full filled podcast episode that you and I have just, um, recorded for my listeners. They are going to walk away with so many, um, just moments of, of beauty for themselves, moments to pause for themselves and to really pivot. And um, you're so accessible. The way that you wrote in your book, your information, the way you speak, it's very accessible to people. And uh, I really like that there's there's no boundaries, there are no rules. It's very, it's a way to personalize each and every one of our approaches to mindfulness and possibly even meditation. 
Absolutely. Jill, I, when you gave me, you just opened the platter for me and I missed the opportunity. If people want to start, I offer some free mindful pauses. Oh, great. Tell us about yeah. that. So um, you can go to my website and under the um, uh, resources or services tab, uh, there's going to be a Tuesday midday pause, which is at 1230. I just guided one today. They last less than 15 minutes, but it's me guiding a mindful pause to stop, breathe, think, and choose. It's a placeholder to remind you to midday, check back in with yourself, practice self-care. I usually tell the participants, go fill up your water bottle during this time. If you haven't had a chance to eat yet, go off screen and maybe have a bite to eat. But we always practice those four simple steps. Um, and then I do that again on Thursday mornings at seven in the morning, because there is wisdom in starting your day, paying yourself first, generate the start of your day, the inner landscape that you want to create and then sustain. Yeah. Uh, so those are two, two practices. They're free. Um, if it's a zoom meeting, so if you sign up for it, mm -hmm. it'll be on your calendar. And even if you don't join me, it'll be on your calendar and it'll remind you, um, to take a mindful pause. Yeah. I love that. I I'm one of those people where I will sign up for things because I'm now being held accountable yes. and it's, it's a great reminder. Um, what a wonderful way to end our episode. I'm going to put all of this information into the show notes. So everybody knows where to go and find you and all the links. And then again, this is the book mindful pause for those of you who are watching us on the YouTube channel and, um, Cammie, I can't thank you enough for your generous time today and sharing all of your expertise and wisdom on uh, creating a mindfulness practice. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity, Jill. Thanks for tuning in everyone. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Lifestyle changes can be hard and overwhelming to make by building your support team of functional medicine, doctors, therapists, and health coaches. You can reach your optimal health goals. Be sure to check out my other podcasts. Until we meet again, stay healthy.